my great pleasure to introduce today's looking speaker, uh, Professor Kenneth Bromberg from University of Utah. He will be speaking about uh, stable commutator analysis in the mapping class group. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks for coming to listen. Um, okay, so first of all, let me say that this is all going to work uh, with uh, a lot of So I'm going to talk about a, a specific aspect of sort of a bigger project with Bestina and Fujiwara. And one of the motivations for giving a specific talk is I think it gives a nice example of how this machinery that we sort of have uh, works for to, 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 to discuss a specific problem. And let me state the theorem that I want to talk about today. So the theorem is about the mapping cross group and stable commutator link in the mapping cross group. So if you don't know what those things are, this theorem might not make sense at first, but I will uh, uh, explain them. So first of all, let sigma be the closed surface. Can you write a little bucket? Oh, sure. It will be not in the corner, so let me just do it. Let's start over here. <laughs> just, just, okay, I'll go ahead. So, and. So, well, I don't always need to assume that the genus of the surface is bigger than three, but there's a few, like, little odds and ends that we need to be cleared up if we don't assume that. So, let's just say that the genus is, is, is three. Um, then there exists a constant which will depend. I may, my epsilons and my sigmas look the same. So, um, there exists a constant depending only on the surface such that for all elements g in the mapping class group of the surface, and again I'll say this is later, either there are two possibilities. One, the stable commutator length of G is bigger than epsilon. Or two, the stable commutator length of G equals zero, and there's some algebraic obstruction. Okay, so I'll define all these things precisely. Um, Soon, but let me just say uh, informally what these things are. So the mapping cross group of the surface, this is the uh, group of homeomorphisms of the surface modulo isotopy. So this turns out to be a nice finitely generated group, and um, that's sort of a, and it's a very important uh, group that's studied in geometric group theory. What is the commutator length of an element? Well, it's the minimum number of commutators that you can use that you need to write down that element. And um, it's most interesting if the, that number is finite. In particular, it's most interesting if, if the group is perfect, if it has a, a, uh, a trivial abelianization, which happens to be the case in that regress group. The stable commutator length is sort of the growth rate of the commutator length as we take g to higher powers. Um, this last thing, I I'll probably won't get to for a while, but uh, so either the stable commutator length has this sort of what's called a spectral gap, or it's zero. And when it's zero, it's zero for very concrete reasons. There's a very uh, specific algebraic construction to the, the stable commutator length being positive. And I'll say what that is eventually. It's not a key part of the talk, but I'll, I'll definitely get to it. OK, so what I'm going to do first is say what the mapping class group is, then I'll talk about the stable commutator length, and then I'll talk about how you show that it's, it's positive. And the key thing here is you want to think of the stable commutator length as sort of an algebraic way of measuring the length of elements in the group. And what we really want to do is connect that algebraic, um, the algebraic quantity to, to geometry. So we're going to construct some geometric uh, spaces that this, the mapping class group acts on, and that's going to be how we're going to produce this positive stable commutator length. And this spectral gap is related to some spectrum of something, or is it just a joke? I think if the spectral gap was uh, a word that people added to, you know, you say it when you talk about the Laplace and it sounded good. I don't know. It doesn't really have any, uh, yeah. Um, I should say that the state, yeah. I'll say a bit more about this when I, when I said this. Um, 
Okay, um, the mapping class group. So the mapping class group, this is a group of homeomorphisms, and for here I'll, I'll assume they're orientation preserving. So this is some huge topological group. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to mod out by the component of the identity. So I'm going to mod out by isotope. Right, so this is a very well-studied group. And let me just write down a, a, a few facts about it. So one, this is finitely generated. So this was proved by Dane, and then reproved by Lickers. And I'll say more about what these generators are in a little bit. And even better, it's finally presented. Do the half in person. So like I said, this is some huge topological group, but when you mod out by the component of the identity, you get some nice finitely presented group. Um, it's a perfect group. In particular, it's a alienization is trivial. So this maybe is a bit surprising. Uh, once you know the, the generators that Dana Lickers came up with, it's actually pretty easy to, to prove. Um, so this was originally proven by Powell, but the, uh, I'll, I'll sort of describe uh, very simply to see if it's due to error. Um, and this isn't so important for this talk, but let me just also say, so the mapping class group, you can think of it algebraically, this is the group of outer order morphisms of pi one of the surface. What is the definition of perfect? Perfect means that the abelianization is trivial. Oh, I thought you said in particular that's what it meant. Oh, I see. Oh, that is the definition. That is the definition. Oh. Yes, yes. <laughs> that is the definition. OK, so what's an example of an element of this group? Well, an example is a Dane twist. Okay, so what is a Dane twist? Well, first of all, let's, let's start with an annulus. So if I have an annulus, across the interval, I can define a map of the annulus to itself that is the identity on the boundary. So here is a map of the annulus itself. It's the identity on the boundary that takes this arc and twists it around once. Okay, so this is some map phi. So phi is equal to um, phi restricted to the boundary of A, which is the identity. But inside, we twist this arc around. You can see right here. Now I can embed this picture in the surface sigma. And then I can de define a map on the, on the surface. So, so at A, sitting in sigma, the uh, collar neighborhood of an essential. Simple close curve. On sigma. So by essential, I just mean that it's homotopic, it's not homotopic to a point, it's homotopically non trivial. So I can take that curve and I can thicken it to an annulus, and then I can define the Dane twist from sigma to itself uh, by the gamma. This is going to be equal to the identity on uh, sigma minus a, and it'll be equal to phi on a. OK, so this is an example of the homeomorphism of the surface to itself. And this, this is also an example of one that is not um, isotopic to the identity. So there are various ways you can see that. One way is you could take a curve that crosses uh, this curve gamma. And after you do the name twist to it, it will have some non trivial intersection with, with, the, with the image curve. Okay, so these are sort of uh, our, 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 uh, some of the most basic examples of elements of the mapping class group. And what uh, Dane and Linker has proved is that these Dane twists, in fact, finally many of them gener generate the mapping class group. So Dane and Linker showed. The mapping class group is generated 
by finitely many Dane twists about non-separating curves. separating curve is a, can be written as a product of commutators. And that, that's what Herrer observes. So let me, there's a, there's a nice relation in the mapping class group. And let me draw that. So if I take So this is so let's say we have a, a sphere with four boundary components that's just sitting inside of our, our bigger surface sigma, sitting inside there essentially, oh, take advantage of the color chalk here, and you can draw some curves on it. So if you notice the two green curves, the green curves, each of them separates the boundary components into pairs of two. And there's a third way we can do this, which is a little trickier to draw. Um, we'll look at the picture and cheat. Right, so it goes down. I'm not sure if I did that clear right. I did my best. So there's a third, you know, so this green curve separates these two from these two. This one separates these two from these two. And then I can draw a third one that separates these two from these two. And it turns out that if you do Dane twists along these three curves, that's equivalent to doing a product of Dane twists along the four boundary curves. Okay, so this is called the lantern relation. So we have the, this lantern relation. And if I call these A, B, yeah, so DA, DB, DC, DD equals doing a gain twist about X, a gain twist about Y, and a gain twist about Z. Okay. So this implies, so one thing to notice here is that all of these, if, if any two non-separating curves are equivalent, any two, not, any two day, day twist about any two non-separating curves, is going to be conjugate elements in the mapping cross group because if you have two non separating curves, there's going to be a homeomorphism of the surface that takes one to the other. That just comes from the classification of surfaces. So all of these elements are actually conjugate, say, to the first one. And using that, you can write down that, that, that uh, Dane twists about a non separating curve. I ran out of space here. Um, is a product of three commutators. So this is very tiny. Just from this relation. Well, in particular, all of the, these these Dane twists are all going to be trivial in the abelianization. Okay, so that tells you that the mapping class group is perfect. Um, so Hare was the one who was realized that this very simple relation gave you, gave you this fact. Okay, so can you do any better than that? I don't know. And uh, even, uh, so uh, maybe, a, maybe what should be an easier question is, what happens, here I'll leave the theorem up there. So what happens if you take powers? Question of Jeff Mess. How many commutators 
you need you need to write the nth power of the gain twist. Well, there's an obvious answer, namely you just take three times n, right? So if you can write a dang twist with three commutators, well, you can certainly write n multiples of it by, by three times n. So the question is, well, maybe you can do better than that. And there certainly are uh, uh, cases when you can. So for example, you could take a, an element of finite order. Um, well, maybe the, you know, maybe the element itself requires 10, day, uh, 10 commutators, but when you take, take it to its 10th power, it becomes trivial and it takes it is a commentator itself. Um, so this was this was open for, you know, I guess Mass asked this in the 80s. This was open for about 10 years. And um, there's a theorem of and, uh, and it says that the, the number of game twists, the number of commutators needed. Grows linearly in that. Okay, so not only so, and they're not saying that it's three times n. That we still don't know. But at least as n goes to infinity, the number of commutators needed is also going to go to infinity, and it's going to grow to infinity as fast as n goes to infinity. What is the hypothesis here? I mean, well, that's just for a day. That's just for a day twist. Oh, I see. That's just for a day twist. Um, and well, the proof I, I can't tell you much about it except that it uses you know symplectic geometry. Um, so uh, the when you're talking about the mapping class group, you're also you can also be thinking about surface bundles over surfaces, and that naturally leads to symplectic geometry, or so I'm told. And I, I mean, if this is way outside of my realm of knowledge of how they did this. Um, what does the constant depend on? What? How do, what does the constant depend on? Saying it grows linearly, does the constant depend on sigma somehow? The constant. No worse than three. I yeah. Well, is that worse than one zero zero? I don't. I don't. I don't know what the. Yeah. So okay. So I'm going to talk about another way of doing this, and the constant will definitely depend on sigma. Um, The, 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 uh, what the constants are, there will be lots of time if one can ask what the constants are, I know. And uh, at least, you know, the, the, the constants that we're going to get here are computable, but not by anything. <coughs> is this the same, when, in this theorem, is it saying that it must grow linearly with n? Is that yes, 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 yes. It grows, you know, the number of net commutators needed grows linearly. Um, so another way of seeing this, and if you look at the paper, this is what it's titled, is that the mapping class group, this is a new approach, is not uniformly perfect. So a group is perfect if every element in the group can be written as a product of commutators. It's uniformly perfect if that number of commutators that you need is uniformly bounded over the whole group. And that's not the case here. And this was the first example where, where this, of an element of the group that, where this was, where it was known that the number of commutators necessary went to infinity as it took the powers. Okay, so let's put a, make some definitions here, and, um, okay, so we'll, let's, let's define the commutator only, so I think the definition of this is pretty clear at this point. Okay, so gamma, this is just some group, and then x is some element in the group, and then the commutator length of x this is the minimum number of commutators needed to write x. All right. 
So what? The curious thing that can happen, as I sort of been alluding to earlier, is that when I take powers of x, this number may not grow. Okay. And I'll come come to this a little bit later. But if you're bored, so one way one way this can happen is if you take an el if you take an element that is conjugate to its inverse, then when you take powers of it, it's it's, it's conjugately bounded. Okay. So so there is some restriction on this thing growing um, that I will come back to when I start talking about this outbreak structure. All right, so we want to measure how this thing grows, and, and, and this, this uh, leads to the stable commutator length. So, define that. So, the stable commutator length of x, well, this is the commutator length of the uh, nth power of x divided by n, and then, well, I didn't tell you that this group was perfect, and if this is if this element is not trivial in the abelianization, if it's not in the commutator subgroup, then I want to think of the commutator length as being infinite, um, and to deal with that, I'm going to put a limit infinite. Okay, so I want to take the commutator length of x to the n, and I want to divide it by n, and then I want to take the limit as n goes to infinity. This this lim inf is here because it could be that every now and then this number is infinite. If the group is perfect, I wouldn't, I wouldn't need that there. All right, so that's the, the stable commutator length. And the, the, the point is that this is something that we can actually compute, or at least we can get lower bounds on. This is very, you know, you give me a very specific group with a very specific element, I, I'm not going to be able to tell you what the commutator length is. Um, but this I can compute. And once, if I can compute this, well then, for example, I know that, that this has to grow uh, linearly, like the Anno Kotrick theorem, this has to go linearly as, as x goes, uh, as I take the, the Covington length of the nth power of x. Okay, so let me talk about what this algebraic construction is. Algebraic construction to the scale of time there as being positive. And uh, what I said earlier was it was sort of a very simple example of where it can happen, but let me say that in the more general case. So, what I want to do is I want to take a collection of elements, I want them all to be conjugate to each other in the group, and I want them all to commute. So, um, so a collection of commuting. Conjugate elements x1 to xk and integers k1 let me call it a j kj is a chiral Okay, so this, the definition of a chiral is, is about the, the elements being commuting and conjugate, and about these integers summing to zero. What does con what do you mean by conjugate? Conjugate to each other. Conjugate to each other in the group. All of these, each of these elements is conjugate to a single element, and they also commute with each other. Okay, the point is then if I take the product of of. Okay, so then if I have this a chiral uh, class here, and I let then if x n equals the sum x one to the k one of x j to the k j. Yes, yes, yes. So something a, a, a collection of group elements and integers is a chiral if the group elements commute and are conjugate, and if the integers sum to zero. And what is the relation between the elements and the integers? 
They're the, so there's a there's an integer for each element. Here, let me let me write down the conclusion, and then maybe this will make more sense. So I take a bunch of elements; they all commute, and they're all conjugate to each other. And then I take them to powers. The sum of the powers is zero. That's my assumption. Then the conclusion is that the, the stable commutator on x n is zero. So all of these spells commute, and they're conjugate to each other. And the, the powers, the sum of all these powers is zero. So I'm a little confused by your notation. So this, this n is not a power. Maybe, maybe, maybe just x instead of x to the or just or x to OK, this is the simplest case when x is just equal to this. But if, in fact, you might, it might be that you need to take x to the n. So if, yeah, so the point is if the stable commutator length of x is positive, then the stable commutator length of x to the n is just going to be n times the stable commutator length of x. Okay, so it's possible that x can't be written this way, but x to the n can be written this way. So this is the, this is the, we want to allow So then you, why not just write y equals x to the n? Okay. Yeah, yeah, I could. But then, yeah, but then the conclusion of the next line, you don't need the, the n. That's x. Yeah, yeah. Just yeah. on the next line, you want x. Oh. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, yes, yes. you're saying it's some power. Is yes, thank you. On the next time, thank you. Thank you. Yes, yes. Right. If some power of x has this property, then the stable commutator is next to you. And this is not difficult um, to, to prove. I mean, it's. It, it, um, and in fact, the easiest case to think about is when x1 is when x2 is the inverse of x1. And these integers. Uh, are just one and negative. Um, okay, so this may seem like how are you going to ever come up with a group that has this collection of elements? But it turns out that the mapping class group is filled with this kind of stuff. I mean, this is really easy. In the mapping class group, what you, um, you have you know, if you have some surface of genus, you know, 5,000, you can find lots of subsurfaces that have, uh, you know, genus 3 with, say, two boundary components or something like that. And then you can take mapping class groups on each of those things that, that are the same in each of those many uh, different components. And so it's, it's easy to, to, to get this in the mapping this, this really happens. Um, okay, what's, what's the second algorithm rate construction, uh, obstruction? So the second one is if stable commutator length of x equals 0, and the stable commutator length of y equals 0, and x and y commute, then the stable commutator length of x times y equals 0. OK, so you can take things like this, and then you can take two things like this that commute with each other, and you can take the product, and you, you get something else whose stable commutator length is 0. Is it supposed to be obvious that the, that the scalar commutator length the, sorry, the stable commutator length of x would be zero in that case. In which case, this one or yes, this one? The first one. It's not supposed to be obvious, but it's supposed to be something that after the talk you could probably sit down and figure out in 15 minutes. But I, I mean, it's, it's not that especially interesting. I mean, it, yeah, it's not. It's not. I wouldn't call it obvious, but it's not hard either. I guess I just don't see how commutator length relates to the fact that they're commuting. Maybe it's the because when you take you need. If it, when you take powers, you want to you want to be able to commute them to write them as a single commutator. Nice. Oh, I see. So the commutator length of the sequence of powers could still grow, but sublinearly, or it's, it's actually going to be. Yeah. So what happens in both the ca these cases is that the commutator length is bounded. Oh, it's the commutator in both these cases, the commutator length. Is actually, oh, somewhere I wrote it down. The commutator length of x to the n in this case is, is bounded, just strictly bounded. In fact, I don't think I don't know that there are any cases of any group that I know of, at least, where the stable commutator length is zero, but the commutator length grows to infinity. So your theorem at least implies that for the mapping class group. For the mapping class group, right, that, that for the mapping class group, there's only two possibilities: the the, the stable commutator length goes linear, or it's bounded.
Okay, so I want to talk a bit about how you show that the stable commutator, like, well, most of the rest of the talk, talking about how you show that the stable commutator is positive. But before I do, let me say that there's a few other situations where this theorem is known. So, other groups where Is a little bit peculiar. I think you probably want to make some statement also that it's not always zero. That there are that, that there are elements where the spectral, where the stable commutator length is bigger than epsilon. I mean, the way it's stated, it could be that option two is always tr is true of every element. Well, option two is is not by that theorem. Right, right. So let me let me say I want to put in some extra statement that. And option one something does exist for it, it does occur for some certain elements, right? Yeah. So I should say in the in the in the case of the mapping class group. So okay. So let, let me let me make a few comments. So this algebraic obstruction, basically, in all these other cases, the only thing that can possibly happen is that you can have elements that are conjugate to their inverse. So that can't happen at all, say in this case, but in these other cases, uh, and in this case, it can. So in these two cases, there is no algebraic obstruction. The stable commutator length is always has a spectral gap. In these two cases, it's possible that you can have elements that are conjugate to its inverse. Um, in the mapping class group, lots of things that can happen, but we understand very well, we have a nice classification of elements in the mapping class group. And um, so we, can, we, we know when this happens and when it doesn't. Okay. But then um, even if you, I mean, the ando Kachik theorem already tells you that option one must happen for something. Right, right, right. So if you give me a particular element, I can tell, yeah, I can tell you if. I'm if just saying that there, there's a statement that you want to make that you didn't state explicitly that, and sometimes option one does occur, right? Right, right, right. Sometimes one option, yeah, yeah, but I want to, it, it's more complicated to state, but I want to say something even stronger than that. I can tell you, you know, that there's a, this Nielsen Thurston classification of mapping class groups, and um, yeah. I, yeah. There is a, there is a more complicated theorem that's more precise. But it, it would, I, I, I chose this more <laughs> refined version because it's a little bit easier, easier to say. Uh, is, is this result known as bad? What? Are there groups that have no spectral gap? Uh, are there groups that have, so. Um, Without everything you can show. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the, uh, the, I think they're, they're just groups where we don't know. But I, I don't, I don't So this is, okay, so what I'm going to talk about next is uh, quasimorphisms and quasimorphisms. So this is related to the second bounded cohomology of the group. And if you have a group that has trivial second bounded cohomology, well, everything should be zero. 
product is the big cost is small and not as well. Okay. So uh, how do you how do you show that the stable commutator length is positive? So well, if you have a group that's perfect, then every homeomorphism to an abelian group is trivial. Okay? Um, so the, the way it turns out that you want us to, to, to look at the stable commutator length is to look at something called polymorphisms. So these are homeomorphisms to the real line, which of course is an abelian group, um, that are almost homeomorphisms. Homomorphisms. Homomorphisms. Terrible words. Okay, so let's start with polymorphisms. Okay, so H from gamma to R is a quasimorphism. If there exists some constant, depending on the group, such that for all x and y in the group, we have that h of the product of x and y minus h of x minus h of y is less than its constant delta. Of course, so if this was a, a homomorphism, this number would be zero. But it's not zero, but it's bounded uniformly, so it's a quasi morph. It's a coarse notion of being a homomorphism. Um, so delta is the defect. Okay, so what's uh, what's what, what's the point of this? Well the, the point is that if you take a quasi-morphism and you apply it to a commutator, H has to be uniformly bounded in those. So, so let's see what that's true. So first of all, let's uh, add another definition. So H is homogeneous if H of X to the N equals N to H of X. And it turns out there's a little trick by that you can, if you take any quasimorphism, there's a unique homogeneous quasimorphism that's a bounded distance from the original one. So we might as well just assume that, that our, our, homomorphism, our quasimorphisms are homogeneous. And so the, then once we do this, there's a little observation that we have. And that is, first of all, that if I take h of x and I conjugate it, I get the same thing. This isn't true for a general quasimorphism, but using this homogeneity property, you can see that these two things have to be equal just by taking both the large powers. And from that, we can observe that if I take H of some commutator, well, what it, I can subtract off, this is, what is this? This is h of x minus h of uh, y x inverse y inverse. Well, notice that this is the negative of this by the homogeneity property. So these two terms cancel out. And by the fact that this is a quasimorphism, this is less than delta. So if you have any element that's a commutator on this homogeneous quasimorphism, it has to be bounded by the defect. So this is just a, you know, so if you had if you had a perfect group, every element could be written by it. Every element could be written as a commutator. And this is just a, you know, this is sort of a fancier version of what I was saying before. If you have a perfect group, every homeomorphism to an abelian group is trivial. Here, if you have uh, a perfect group, um, if you have, yeah. So here, this is if you, if you have an element that's a commutator, then it's then it's uniform bound. And in general, you can just sort of apply this to a product of commutators. You get that h of x 
the, the quasi-morphism on x is going to be less than 2 times the commutator length of x um, minus 1 times the That's just taking this fact and applying it to a product of commutators. And then from that, you see that the stable commutator length of x is greater than h of x. And this is our trick. This is how we're going to get that the stable commutator length is positive by producing positive morphisms. And if you know anything about boundary cohomology, these quasi morphisms uh, are, are the way you show that the, the boundary cohomology, the second boundary cohomology of the group is, is, not, is not true. Okay, so we want to do some geometry. How do you, how do you construct quasi-morphisms? Okay, so this is the construction that goes back to, to Brooks. So the original construction of Brooks was something that was happening on the free group. The free group. And we'll just take the free group of two generators. Okay, and I'm going to construct a quasi-morphism, and that quasi-morphism is going to be depend on choosing some word in the group. So W, so it's a cyclic you reduced word. This isn't so important. You go back to the larger handwriting. Oh, okay, yes. Okay, so we take some sigma reduced word, and then I'm going to define a quasi-morphism. It's going to depend on W, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to take X, some element of the free group, and I'm going to count the number of times the word W appears. So this is the number of copies of W. And, X. and then I'm going to subtract from it the number of copies of W inverse and X. Okay, so this I take this element of the free group, I make sure it's a reduced word, I look I look and I see how many times does W appear, I count those up, and then I then I take W inverse, I look at how many times it appears, and I count those up, and I subtract. And <coughs> so can you use a disjunct copy. You could choose to do that, and in fact, uh, you don't have to. Yeah. Um, there. Are, yeah. So actually, what we do, I mean, I won't get into that much detail, but what we do here, we will want to choose distinct copies, but uh, you don't have to. It will, what, what happens if you choose, you'll get a, the defect will be worse if you don't, don't do that. You definitely want to subtract it, otherwise you can You definitely want to subtract. That, that, is, that's, that you have to do. So the theorem is that um, HW is, and I'll put this in quotes, interesting quasimorphism. What would be an uninteresting one? Okay, what would be an uninteresting quasi-morphism? Well, for example, a bounded function would be a quasi-morphism, and that wouldn't be too exciting. A, a homomorphism would also be a quasi-morphism, and that wouldn't be too exciting. This is this is this one is not going to be a quasi. Oh, um, it is it is not going to be either a bounded function or boundedly close to a homomorphism. In fact, another way of writing this is if I take the homo this this will not be homogeneous as as it is, but if I make it homogeneous, it will be a non-trivial uh, quasi-morphism. Um, okay, well, I said there'd be geometry, and this so far doesn't sound very geometric. But the way to think about this is well, I'm going to draw the Cayley graph. Of the 
three group. So this is a three. And on this Kelly graph, I can think of my word as being um, a segment. And what I'm looking for is if I take the color somewhere here. What I'm looking for is if I take some other element, so, over, so this is W, and over here, say, is X, what I'm looking for is the number of translates of this segment W in X, in the word X. So here's X. And maybe there's some translate of W here. Maybe there's another one here. And then maybe there's some others going in the opposite direction. I'll draw those in blue. And I want to count the ones that are going in the forward direction, and I want to separate the ones that are going in the negative direction. Now, um, why is this a quasimorphism? Well, there's a nice little picture you can draw there. So I can make a tripod by taking a piece of the, the Kaley graph. I'm going to take the identity element, I'm going to take x, and I'm going to take xy. So here is the segment from here to here is x. The segment from here to here I can think of as being y, and then the segment from here to here, of course, is, is xy. And what will happen is that I have you know, some copies of the word here, some copies of the word here, and if I look at this copy of the word uh, of W sitting inside X, it will be going in the other direction on Y. So it will be canceled out by Y. Um, the only time that won't happen is words that cross this central point. So when I take you know, H of X, H of Y, and H of XY, the only things that won't cancel out are, are, are words that, that, that cross the central point. But that number is bounded. It's bounded depending on the length of the word. Well, if I do the non-overlapping case, then it will be, be um, uh, then it will be bounded by six. But even if I allow them to overlap, it will, it will still be bounded depending on the length of the word. And that shows that it's a puzzle word. Uh, okay, so wh why do I want to think about this geometrically? Well, if my Cayley graph is a tree, then I have a free group. But there are many groups that act on trees that, that, uh, that aren't free groups. And I can do the same thing. Um, even better, there are groups that act on things that aren't trees, but are coarsely look like trees, that are quasi-asymmetric trees. And, and I can make the same construction work there. And it turns out that the mapping best group is, is such a group. So let me say uh, what I mean there. So Q is a quasi tree. If there exists a tree, T, and a map, phi, from Q to T, such that, well, I want this map, so these are both metric spaces. So this is, so G has a metric space. So I want to think of the tree as not just being topologically being a tree, but I want it to have a metric. And I want there to be a map from this metric space to this one, such that if I take the distance between phi of x and phi of y, 
and t, this is less than some constant, that's the distance of x and y, and q plus some additive constant. And then I want to have a similar bound below. And phi is coarsely on here. So by this, I just mean that every point here is uniformly close to a point in the image. OK, so it's not quite metrically a tree, but it, if you look at it from far away, it, it is almost a tree. And as with many things in geometric group theory, this is these, if, you, if you coarsen the definitions, you can often, you know, it, it's good enough to do this kind of procedure. Well, we need to put some restrictions on what we do. but. Um, Basically, the same procedure works. So now our goal becomes, our goal is uh, find many actions of the mapping class group on closet trees. So why do I want to find many actions? So let's go back and look at this original Brooks construction. So let's put this in there. If I look at this um, quasi-morphism that I constructed, well, what do I want to do? If I want to show that the stable commutator like some element is positive, then I want to construct a quasi-morphism that a uh, homogeneous quasi-morphism that is positive on that element. So what elements is this particular quasimorphism positive? Well, one that it's positive for sure on is, is W. Right? So if I notice in this, in this particular example, this is why I said safely to reduce H of W of N equals N. Um, OK, so if I have some particular element of the mapping class group, I want to find a quasi-tree such that the, 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 um, that the homomorphism that I constructed uh, was non-trivial on that particular element. So what is the condition I need? Well, in a free group, it's pretty easy. I can basically choose anything, right? Well, at least any cyclic reduced thing, and it works. Um, if I have a general group acting on the tree, what might happen is there are going to be some elements that have bounded orbits on that action. Otherwise, it would be a free group. Um, so I need to construct, if I have some, you know, say, infinite order element of the mapping class group, I want to construct a quality tree where that element acts with an infinite order. That word acts hyperbolic, which is a fancy way of saying it. And that is what this machinery that, that, I, 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 uh, that, we, um, that we have built with Bestini and Fujiwara that, that we want to use here. So let me write down the theorem. Okay, so there's going to be some technical assumptions here. So let's say we have some group. That assume gamma acts on a geodesic metric space. And we have some element x in the group with the following two properties. One, x, um, okay, so let me write down the conditions and then I'll say what they are has a strongly contracting axis. <coughs> How much time did I left? Okay, let me do this last one. Let me draw a picture. So something about projections. Let me just draw a picture. I think it'll be clearer than trying to get it in ways. Okay, 
So what, this, this, this group is going to act on um, some space uh, x. Oh, I shouldn't have called low things x. So x is the metric space. And we have my group gamma acting on it. And if I look at, at my element x in my group, this is a little x, in the group, the way x acts on it, x is going to, there's going to be some axis, so here's the bigger space x, and there's going to be some axis for x. So along, um, along this axis, x is going to act like translation. So it's going to fix this axis, really only needs to do it coarsely, but let's ignore that for now. So it's going to fix this axis and it's an actual translation. Now I can take this axis and I can translate the axis by the group, and I'll get lots of other copies. So the blue word is translate to the axis, and the property that I want is that when I take these other um, these other axes and I project them down to the, to the using this the metric I have here, when I project the translates of the axis of x to the axis of x, the size of that projection will be uniformly bounded. Now these conditions may seem like they're sort of technical, but these are natural things that occur when you have a group back in a space of negative curvature. Now I have a less restrictive condition because I don't want to assume that there's negative curvature everywhere. Um, okay, so once I have this set up, right, the conclusion of the theorem, so once I have this set up, then the conclusion is I can apply the Brooks construction so the conclusion of that theorem is that I can apply the Brooks construction show that the state of commutator length of this element is positive. And in fact, I can do it in a way that I can control, that I have some control over what that, that positive number is um, that's sort of related to, the, to, to uh, the size of those projections. Okay, let me finish just by saying um, one Final word about this. So, so what, what goes into the proof of that? Well, for the mapping class group, there are there's a very nice space that the the, the mapping class group X on called the curve complex. And this is a, a nice normal hyperbolic space, and it will have all these properties. Um, and once what we want to do is we want to take this original action and we want to produce. So, say so we want to use action on X to produce an action on a quasi-tree uh, Q with similar properties. And then form it, and then, and then apply both. So um, yeah, so the, the the one of the you know what this machinery that we built is, is designed exactly to do that. It takes some action on a metric space and it produces an action on a quasi tree. And here there are we already we have these actions of the of the curve complex. I mean of the mapping class group on things like Teichmore space on on the curve complex, and we can, and they satisfy this property, and we can use that to produce um, these 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 actions on quasi trees, and that's what that's what gives us. Okay, I'll stop. Any more questions? Yeah. Do you say in a word what the, what the relationship between sigma and epsilon is? As sigma gets bigger, epsilon gets smaller. Do you mean genus? So genus gets bigger, yeah. Jigger, jigger. It's not the kind of, I mean, I'm, I mean, how, what is it about sigma? Makes this quantity positive. What, what is this quantity? 
So, um, yeah, so everything we do is constructive, and in theory, you, you could try and figure things out. Um, but so, figure out what the contents were and how they grew from what we did, but I, I, would, I wouldn't think you'd get very good answers, and it probably wouldn't be worth the trouble. But the main thing that, so the simplest thing you could think about is if you look at the action of the curve, of the map quest group on the curve complex, or on Tychmore space, if you look at that, you could look at the minimal translation length of the pseudo and also, and that decreases in genus. And I forget what the rates are, but th those are known. Those quantities are sort of known, and it's related to that. So when you call the phenomenon of option one a spectral gap, huh. okay, could you relate that to other notions of spectral gap? Uh, no, I don't. That, that was, I, think, I think it was Calgary who called it the spectral gap. I think it just looks like it's, I, I don't know what the motivation is there. I should say, yeah, I meant to say this earlier. One of the reasons why, you know, so this would be sort of silly if the if the if the uh, if the spectrum, the stable commutator spectrum, was discrete, but it's not. Okay, so this this is not a, the, the set of numbers you get here is definitely not going to be discrete. And the way you can see that is if you have say a, a free group, if you have one group sitting inside of the other, the the stable commutator is only going to get smaller in the bigger group. So if you have say a free group and you have some element there that has stable commutator length two. Well, you can keep on nesting copies of that tree group in itself, and you get infinitely many elements that will all have stable commutator length less than two. Um, so this set of stable commutator length is, is, is not discrete. So um, that's why this thing is made as a display. So I guess also the no such surprise in this category. Yeah, so in, the, in the case of the mapping class group, so you know exactly which elements are in class one, which are Yes and no, because there are pseudo and ossos, for example, that are conjugate to their inverses. And those are class two, is what you're saying. Those are class two, right. So what is rough characterization? So you look at So if you gave me a particular element, I could tell you, right? So, um, yeah, I mean, the, the, there is this Nielsen Thurston classification, and then, you know, the, then. Okay, I've given you some pseudonyms, so how would you decide? So, but, uh, but. No, no, you really have to give me the pseudonyms. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can't, yeah, yeah. So, so there, there are ways, like, so, so there are ways, so, um, I don't know, there is no, I mean, yeah, there, there's no really concise answer, which is why I wrote it this way. Um, but for example, you could take two finite order things and you could take, you know, you take two or two things, and you can uh, what? And you can take the product, and then um, and it, would, it could be pseudo and also. But then that thing would be kind of because it's inverse. I said it correctly. Not quite right, but there, there are definitely ways of constructing pseudo and also that are conjugate to their inverse. So that that that's the thing to talk about. So how has the statement changed for genus two? Why did you have to? Look oh, maybe here I didn't need yeah, genus. I mostly I was saying that the, 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 this is this this group. If it's genus two, it's not it's not um, perfect. The, the organization is finite, but not perfect. So that, that yeah. I was mostly thinking of things I was saying later, not not particular statement. That that this particular statement is true for all genus and all punctures and so on. Does your technique apply to other groups? Yeah, yeah. So for example, you could we could. Reprove the Caligari and the Caligari free to wire result. Um, yeah. Okay, so Misha is organizing the dinner, so if you want to go to the dinner, please talk to him afterwards. So let's speak again.